In the borough of Barnsley, the small village of Elsica sits between the rolling hills of South Yorkshire. Home to some of England's best preserved heritage, Elsica provides a rare glimpse into how our ancestors lived. From furnaces and foundries to innovations that changed the face of industry. Elsica's 250 year industrial heritage is still standing and waiting for you to explore. We start our tour here at the Elsica Heritage Centre. Today, this houses places where you can grab a bite to eat or drink, or even for your kids to have a play around in. However, it's also home to one of the ironworks that once served the village, built over a hundred years ago. Coal would come up from the mines and be used to feed the huge furnaces that once operated here. Then, the finished iron would be loaded onto barges and shipped down the canal. At one point, Elsica was exporting some 200,000 tonnes of goods every year and by 1850 the canal just wasn't enough and so a railway was built to keep up with demand. Iron from these very workshops was used to build buildings, bridges, railways, machines, mines all across the country. But all that iron needed a lot of coal and one inventor, Thomas Newcomen, had an idea. The first stop on our tour takes us just outside the workshop to an invention that revolutionised the mining industry. In the 18th century, miners faced a big problem. Some coal seams were just too deep. Water from the ground would flood the mines, making it impossible to work them. And that's where the inventor, by the name of Thomas Newcomen, stepped in. You see, Thomas Newcomen invented steam engines, like the one here, with the purpose of bringing water out of the mines. An engine like this could pull 50 gallons of water in a single stroke and some 600 were made across the country. This one here at Elsica is the only one in the entire world still in its original location. And on the floor there are some metal coverings beneath which is a pipe that goes all the way down to the bottom of the mine shaft. And this was used for bringing water from the mines back up to the top. Now you see the large frame behind me. This is the winding gear still in the original location where the mine shaft was sunk. This was used for bringing miners from the top to the bottom of the mine shaft and then bringing coal back up to the top. But Elsica Colliery had more than one mine shaft, so let's go see the others. Our next stop is just a short walk along the canal. Now you're probably wondering, where on earth we are? We're here to see a mine shaft, right? Well, those of you with a keen eye might be able to spot something hiding in the trees. Do you see it? Look closer. No, closer. There, poking out from the leaves, that sign marks where the shaft was sunk. Now, it's easy to miss, so keep your eyes peeled. It's no mistake as well that the shaft was built so close to the canal. You see these stones built along the ground. Coal from the shaft would come up and be loaded onto barges that would be moored right along the edge here. 
And if you're wondering how mine has got to and from work, cast your eyes over there. Now it might not look like much, but that is all that remains of a bridge that used to come over the canal, connecting the mine to the village, which, funnily enough, is where we're headed off to next. Just a short hop across the canal brings us to the very houses the miners lived in. There are about seven rows of historical significance here. The first and the oldest is the fittingly titled Old Row. This comprises 15 plain two-storey cottages that were built by 1795. Then there was Distillery Row, built by 1799, close to the new colliery site. The house on the end was actually the first school in the village. Then there was Station Row, which was built by 1800. Meadow Row too was built in the same year. It wasn't until 1837 that Reform Row was built. This stunning curve of 28 cottages was built as an extension to facilitate an expansion in Elsica New Colliery. Fitzwilliam Street, built in the 1860s, comprises plain cottages, but also five very high quality houses which we believe belonged to the mining supervisors. Now here we are outside one of the most interesting pieces of housing in the entire village. This is Cobb Car Lane. Built around 1860, at the end is Cobb Car Terrace, or as it's more locally known, Rhubarb Row. Why? Well, it's quite simple really. They used to grow rhubarb in the front gardens. This was part of a Dig for Victory campaign during the Second World War. But that rhubarb wasn't being used for food. It was being used for wine. The houses were of exceptionally high quality because they were paid for by the 5th Earl Fitzwilliam. Now, the Fitzwilliams were the driving force behind the industrialisation of Elsica. They were famously kind to their workers, providing them with excellent housing as well as plenty of other benefits. They were the ones who really brought coal and iron to this little village. But they also brought another industry with them, a very different industry. The Fitzwilliams were a wealthy family who bought land here in Elsica in the 1700s and 1800s. This splendid building behind me is the old flour mill. It was constructed in 1842 and it started life as a corn mill. However, not 32 years after being built in 1874, tragedy struck. A young man was walking past the mill and just happened to look inside. To his horror, he noticed that the entire interior was ablaze. He alerted the village. People came from miles around to try and help put it out. Nearly everyone in the village tried to help. But alas, it was in vain. The owners lost everything. It cost them £4,000 worth of damages, which in today's money is £250,000. By 1895, the site was put up for auction. And by 1899, the owners put everything else they had up for sale as well. That's where the Fitzwilliams stepped in. In 1929, they reopened the site as the flour mill. Their impact on local heritage is visible for all to see today. The big letters up there, EFW, stand for Earl Fitzwilliams of Wentworth. Today, however, it is actually a stained glass and lighting shop. Under the fifth Earl Fitzwilliam, a mass wave of building was undertaken here at Elsica. We've seen collieries, we've seen housing, and now we've seen flour milling. However, the next building the 5th Earl constructed was not one of industry, but one of religion.
This is the Holy Trinity Church. On Pentecost Monday, 1842, the fifth Earl Fitzwilliam himself laid down the foundation stone that the rest of the church was to be built upon. It cost about £2,500 for the church to be built, which in today's money equals a whopping £151,000. On the 6th of June, it was consecrated, that is, made sacred, by the Archbishop of York. Let's take a look inside, shall we? It has sandstone walls and a slate roof, and the design is early English. Now that's just a name that the Victorians gave to churches that were based off a 13th, 14th century Gothic style design. One of the most striking features about this beautiful church are the four stained glass windows at the very end here. Starting from the left, the first one depicts a saint in white armour and underneath him, David slain Goliath. The second shows Christ in red robes and the raising of Lazarus. The third depicts Saint Sebastian with his shield pierced by arrows and Saint George slaying the dragon. The final one on the far right shows Saint Michael standing on Satan and the raising of dead warriors. Now, when you think war memorial, you don't always necessarily think stained glass windows. And yet, that is what these are. Installed in 1920, these were dedicated to the men of Elsica who gave their lives in the First World War. The fifth Earl Fitzwilliam had this church built because Elsica had grown so much that a formal religious meeting place was deemed necessary. Our next stop, and indeed the Earl's next building, lies just down the road. The rows of housing weren't the only pieces of accommodation the Fitzwilliams paid for, though. In 1853, the fifth Earl Fitzwilliam commissioned this, the Miner's Lodge, to be built. And much like the housing, it is of exceptionally high quality. And that was thanks to the architect who designed it, a certain John Carr. John Carr of York, born 1723, was a well-renowned architect who was also responsible for work on Harewood House and Wentworth Woodhouse. His style was usually Palladian and you could usually tell if it was his work or not because a lot of his buildings had perfect symmetry on them. The Miners Lodge, or Fitzwilliams Lodge as it's also known, was designed for single miners who used to work at Elsica High Colliery. It had 22 bedrooms and even had its own social club, a, a teetotal one though, mind you. That's actually how the club got its name, the Bun and Milk Club. Today, these are used as apartments, as in the 1980s, they were renovated by the architect Nuttall Yarwood and Partners. This is the last building the 5th Earl Fitzwilliam constructed. Our next location is one that has been used by the community for decades. However, it is not one of industry, but rather one of tourism. Let's take a short walk and have a stroll in the park. This park has been here for the best part of a century. It opened in the early 1900s and became a huge tourist attraction. Families would come from miles around, armed only with sandwiches and water, ready for a day in the park. An obvious attraction is the bandstand right behind me. 
This was built by a Rotherham-based foundry, Yates and Haywood. Now, that company was most famous for building old coke-burning kitchen stoves. They even won awards for it. Yet, in 1930, they built a bandstand right here in Elsica. Because did you know that for many, Elsica was their nearest seaside town? Every September, people come from all around to the Elsica by the Sea Festival. And just through the park and up the hill, we'll see how it got its name. This is Elsica Reservoir. Construction began in 1794 and it was originally built to provide water for the Dove and Dern Canal. However, by the 1900s, it served a much different purpose. In 1910, the Sheffield Star just happened to take a photo of some locals enjoying themselves and relaxing by the reservoir. They titled it Elsica by the Sea. By accident, the Sheffield Star had made history and begun a tradition. Every year, people flock here just to sit back by the water and enjoy themselves in the warmer weather. When we look at a reservoir, we don't necessarily think history. Yet, this body of water holds its fair share of stories. In 1902, a woman named Lily Shaw was charged with manslaughter for drowning her four months old son in the reservoir. But it's also seen its fair share of bravery. In 1930, a 14-year-old, Alfred Gaunt, risked his life by diving into the reservoir to save the lives of two children who were drowning. In 1996, it was designated a local nature reserve and it's used today by the locals and visitors for walks, picnics and even fishing. This is the last destination of our journey together and it seems a fitting one to end on. This is a place that was central to both industry and the community. Elsica has a rich and varied history. It started out as a farming village until coal mining arrived in 1750. This heritage is conserved and available for everyone to enjoy today. But it's not just limited to the sites we visited, oh no. There are many more secrets and stories here at Elsica waiting to be explored, waiting for you.